Explosion in the passing game is considered one of the Colts' biggest needs, but it's not often discussed as to exactly why that is. But we're going to do that today. Let's get to it. You are Locked On Colts, your daily Indianapolis Colts podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right. Thanks for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day. This is your daily podcast covering your Indianapolis Colts, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. What is up, everybody? This is Jake Arthur and Zach Hicks of HorseshoeHuddle.com. And today, we are going to get more detailed into the Colts uh, and some of their needs and why they need some certain things. Uh, Most notably, we talk a lot about, you know, everyone knows they need corner and safety. But ever since the season ended, we've talked about explosion in the passing game being a need. Chris Ballard has talked about it. Shane Steichen has talked about it. Um, so everyone kind of got on board immediately, but we're going to actually discuss why it's needed that need for speed today. Uh, and then we're also going to move along to edge defender. Cause that's been a little bit of a hot topic lately. Uh, if you heard yesterday's show, we talked about why like Dallas Turner, if he's available there, that of course makes sense, but that's like a blue chipper falling in their lap, but do they want the position in general early in the draft? We'll get to that. Uh, And then Zach, who has specialized in offensive line throughout this draft cycle, especially working on the uh, the Indy draft guide, he's going to dive into uh, some later offensive linemen and why that is the absolute perfect spot for the Colts to grab one this year. Uh, But first and foremost, why the need at speed, uh, need for speed at receiver this year, Zach? Yeah, I mean, I think there's multiple reasons why we're seeing the Colts invest a lot of time into speedy wide receiver prospects this draft cycle. Uh, Wide receiver coach Reggie Wayne has been spotted at a couple pro days this offseason, and they've all been at pro days for guys who are just absolute burners. Troy Franklin at Oregon, Reggie Wayne was on hand to to watch that pro day. Uh, He was at Texas along with a huge contingent of Colts uh, coaching staff members. Uh, to watch Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell. Uh, And then he was also at the LSU Pro Day to watch uh, Brian Thomas Jr. So he's been on hand to watch a lot of these burners in this class. And I think when you're looking at the Colts wide receiver room at the moment, if you're going to, I guess if you're going to upgrade anything in the starting lineup, it is that vertical speed threat. You have Michael Pittman Jr. You have that guy who can win over the middle of the field, who can be your pace setter, who can be your guy who can win after the catch. You have Josh Downs, who is your slot receiver, who can win in those quick win situations and in those isolated backside uh, formations. Uh, But you don't really have that vertical juice. Like you have Alec Pierce, and I love Alec Pierce. I think he can be good with um, Anthony Richardson next year. I'm definitely not counting him out as of right now, Uh, but even Alec Pierce at his best, he's more of a Mike Williams vertical threat. He's not this, you know, he's not a vertical threat where two steps and he's gone, you know, two steps in a cloud of dust. He's gone. You know, it's not Tyreek Hill. It's not, you know, those type of vertical threats. He's more of that Mike Williams where he's going to stack you, get behind you and then beat you at the catch point. That that's where Alec Pierce wins. And while there is value in that, and there's still value in him running off safeties, he's not a player that really draws the gravity that a legit speed threat has. You know, a guy like an Xavier Worthy, a guy like a Brian Thomas Jr., even a guy like A.D. Mitchell when he actually wants to, you know, run his routes out there, or Troy Franklin. You know, these are guys who are legit vertical players who can get down the field, win vertically, and and have that gravity to pull safeties and corners back. I mean, watching Xavier Worthy's film, for instance, uh, this is a guy where corners are playing 10 to 15 yards off the ball with him, and he's winning underneath because nobody's even in the vicinity of him. But I'm not even saying it has to be Xavier Worthy. You know, it's just one of many names here. Uh, But I do think the Colts want to get more explosive on offense. And the best way to do that is to add a legit explosive player. Again, Pittman and Downs, good underneath players, not the most explosive in creating, you know, big plays underneath, but they have the capability of doing that, but it's just not their bread and butter. Same with Alec Pierce, where he can win vertically, but he's not this guy who's going to be, 
you know, explosive, explosive, explosive all the time. Uh, but grab a guy like Thomas or Worthy or Mitchell, Leggett, Franklin, like these are just a couple of the names here. Those are guys where their bread and butter, butter is the explosive. The Colts last year were 23rd in explosive plays created through the passing game uh, and last season. And a lot of that came with Anthony Richardson. I mean, like there was like eight of them that were with Anthony Richardson when Richardson played. So with Gardner Minshew starting like a good 14 games, it was like 30 something explosive pass plays. That's just not good enough. That's not good enough for a Shane Steichen offense. You need to create more at wide receiver in the passing game when it comes to explosives. And the number one way to do that is to add an explosive threat. Uh, our good buddy, Kenan, uh, actually sent me something before we recorded today that, you know, in the Jonathan Taylor trade talks last year, they asked the Packers for Christian Watson and they asked the uh, Dolphins for Jalen Waddle. Now, were those ever going to come to fruition? No, those were never going to come to fruition, but they wanted to see if they could catch those teams being desperate enough to give up their vertical speed threat guys. I mean, two guys who are running in the four threes, explosive players who can, who can get down the field. So I do think there is legit interest from the Colts in adding this speed threat guy. I mean, again, we've seen the smoke this draft season with it. We've seen it in that trade discussion last year with Jonathan Taylor. So I do think the Colts want to get more vertical and explosive, but they just haven't had that guy. This year, it looks like the type of class where, again, whether it's Brian Thomas, Xavier Worthy, A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Leggett, Jory Franklin, you know, tons of guys we could talk about here. There is an opportunity to add that explosive threat. It doesn't need to be your wide receiver one in year one, but it can be a guy who can come in and be that explosive player where, hey, he can take a quick screen 50 yards to the house. Hey, he can get vertical behind a safety or behind a corner. Uh, and and lead to a 50, 60 yard touchdown over the top. Like that is something this team has really been missing, even though Alec Pierce has kind of been the, the, the supplement for that as of right now. But I do think that that's something the team is missing. They are missing that next level juice at wide receiver. And this class has a lot of juice. I mean, there was a ton of guys who ran the four threes and four twos at the combine. This is a class that's perfect for the Colts to add that speed threat. And it doesn't have to be round one. It could be round two, round three, round four, round five, whatever it is. They can add that guy in this draft, and I think that's what the Colts want to do. I, I think that's a good point you made there. That you know there there are guys who are build up head of steam downfield threats like Alec Pierce. Because don't get me wrong, he absolutely is an effective one. But like you mentioned, it's not like an instant thing. It's not like the kid from The Incredibles where he's just flying around all the yeah. time. <laughs> right, like right. You you it's it's more useful to have a speed guy who's not such a niche player. Like he's got speed and can do that but he can win underneath like worthy can, and he can do this and that, and he can win at different levels of the field. And that may be a reason why Reggie Wayne has gone to some of these, these speedier receivers pro days is like from your eyes, Reggie, who has the best intangibles of the speed guys, like who can offer more than just their speed and, and vertical threats. So I, I think that's, that's definitely good. Um, and again, like you said, they don't have to be a starter right away. Cause I mean, they're not ready to give up on Alec Pierce either. Like they, they, I think they definitely want to see what he does with Anthony Richardson. Uh, but if you've got a guy to develop behind him and then after this year, you decide that guy is really the better option moving forward, then you're, you are a year ahead of it. So uh, I totally agree. Um, I'm, I'm interested though. I don't think they're going to wait until day three to look at some of the receivers, but you know, you're looking at like Ryan Flournoy. I know your guy, Bub means uh, that that's, that's one of your guys. Um, I've got a couple other names here just from like day three guys who, who had decent forties, uh, Cornelius Johnson and Jacob Cowling as well. Uh, was there anyone else on your radar, you know, maybe mid to later in the draft? Cause I feel like everybody who follows the draft for the Colts right now, at least knows of the guys from the first couple rounds. Yeah. There, I mean, Malik Washington from Virginia is another name that pops in there. He's getting some round three love, but I do think he ultimately goes some, you know, early round four, uh, round five, maybe, but he's another one to really watch. There's a couple guys, you know, the, one of the Washington receiver thing is Jalen McMillan is more of the vertical type guy in mm -hmm. that offense. Uh, Jalen Polk can kind of do more of the underneath and intermediate stuff. McMillan has that vertical juice to get over the top, but you know, there's a ton of dudes in this draft class, ton of dudes in this draft class who can do what the Colts need to do. It, you know, when we're talking about adding the speed threat to the offense, I won't go too long on this one, but it doesn't have to be a worthy in round one. It can be the guy that you draft to replace and just be the better version of what Isaiah McKenzie was last year. Because early in the year, they try to get McKenzie out there for some quick screens, some pre-snap motion stuff for some cheap motions. And he just wasn't that guy. Like it just wasn't that guy. So if you draft a guy like, say, Troy Franklin or Tez Walker in round two or three, whatever it is, you can do some of those similar things. 
but have a better version of Isaiah McKenzie. You know, just just add some speed to this wide receiver room. It doesn't even have to be a starter over Alec Pierce, uh, but I do think that can just add some speed to this wide receiver room, and that's just, just going to help this team next year. And it's going to help Anthony Richardson just bring back explosive football uh, to Indianapolis. For sure. Uh, so coming up here, we're going to talk about a position that's almost the polar opposite of receiver, and that is edge defender and whether or not the Colts might be actually interested in looking to add one early in the draft. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in your day? Whether you go for a run, take a nap, read a book, show up for a friend, you know, make that call you've been missing, what would you do? Uh, for me personally, I have more time now. So, you know, I'm, I'm in a new day job. I'm using some of those extra hours to get stuff done around the house that you just can't do when you're commuting to and from the office all the time. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time in general. And the question is time for what? If it was unlimited, again, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make that a priority. And therapy can help you find out what actually matters to you so you can do more of it and kind of leave the guilt behind of the stuff you think you're supposed to be keeping up on but isn't really a high priority. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. All right, Zach. So a kind of a dark horse position we've discussed for this draft cycle uh particularly in round one it's it's mostly the dallas turner thing you know a, a blue chip player the best edge defender for most people uh in this draft if he's available to them at 15 they don't need edge but do they go ahead and do it because it's too good to pass up you know people have kind of thrown jared verse in there as well because he's an athletic guy with room to grow and he kind of fits what the colts have historically done if they trade down, you know, a guy like Chop Robinson late in the first round makes sense as well if they really like Edge. And recently, I think this was all really given legs because uh, Stephen Holder reported that the Colts were interested in uh, Daniel Hunter, former Minnesota Viking, who actually chose less money with the, uh, the Texans to kind of, you know, give his hometown team a little discount. But that meant the Colts were interested in a – an elite edge defender in the NFL who has been one of the more successful pass rushers of the last handful of years. So does that mean that the Colts really value the position and they're looking to upgrade and get some more juice there? Or is it just that they saw an opportunity to add an elite player in free agency at a cost they could live with? Yeah. Yeah. I do think it's more of they saw the potential for an elite player. I don't think it says too much about the edge rush room. But one thing I did want to talk about in this segment and why I suggested us talk about, you know, adding an edge rusher in this class is, you know, sometimes when it comes to the draft, you have to look at the future. I know it's hard for us to do that with the Indianapolis Colts because Chris Ballard loves to go into each draft with like one or two major positions of need that he instantly fills in round one or two. Like he, he just, he drafts for need really in, in rounds one or two. And luckily he has a pretty good hit rate with that, but I, I digress. I'm not here to talk about that today. What I'm here to talk about though, is if you are looking to the future, you know, if we flash forward to the 2025 uh, free agency class for the Colts, you know, you're looking at Dio Dangbo being a free agent. You're looking at Samson Ebu Kam not being a free agent yet, but he has a major out in his deal. So if he does struggle this year, he doesn't have a great year. The Colts can take that out and, and get out of that contract if they have to. And then you have Quiddy Pay, where the Colts have a decision coming after the draft to pick up his fifth-year option or not. And if they don't pick that up, then he will be a free agent. So you're potentially looking at having to replace Dio Dangbo, potentially having to replace Quiddy Pay, maybe Samson Ebukam. And even if you don't replace him, he only got, has one year left on his deal and he'll be 30 years old. So, you know, as of right now, if we look at this Colts edge, Colts edge rush room, you know, they have a lot of guys they like. They have a lot of guys who they think can do some good things for them. But that can drastically change after this next season, regardless of what these guys do on the field. You know, it could be if they all have great breakout seasons, 
Well, you can only pay like one or two of them. You're not going to be able to pay all of them. And then the the reverse could happen where they all struggle this year. And then you have to, you know, revamp the entire room. So if there is a Dallas Turner on the board, like we talked about in yesterday's show, it makes a ton of sense for them to go that route. But even if, you know, it, it's not that blue chipper, it's not that Dallas Turner, maybe they're looking to the future and they're saying, hey, you know what? We probably don't want to bring back Quiddy Pay. We love the run defense, but he's just not getting it as a pass rusher. Let's start over and get a Jared Verse in here. You know, let's get a Jared Verse in here. We like the traits he has. We like the intangibles. Let's see what he can do. Or maybe, like you said, you know, maybe the, the whole power rusher thing is not working for us. It's time to go speed rusher. Let's get Chop Robinson in here and see what this athletic juiced up speed rusher can do. I think that is a very realistic possibility for the Colts. I don't think it's likely. I think it's more likely that they go corner early in round one or, or, you know, wherever they are picking in round one come draft day. I think it's more likely they even go explosive wide receiver than edge, but I could see an edge rusher. I, I, I can't rule out edge rusher just because, again, it it's something where you always have to be throwing picks at. Chris Bout has spent a lot of picks in the day two range on edge in his career. He spent one on Quiddy Pay as well. He spent a first round or first round pick on Quiddy Pay. So, he has thrown a lot of resources at the edge rush group, including trading, you know, Rocky Sin for Yannick Ngakwe, uh, signing Justin Houston, bringing in Danico Autry. Like he it has been a lot of capital at the edge rush room. And I, I expect him to continually throw capital at it. So if it does turn into a first round pick at edge or, or you know, a second round pick at edge, it wouldn't shock me at all because it's something that he has done throughout his entire career. Hey, everyone. Uh, no, so I, I agree. I, I think edge rusher is one of those positions that you probably want to add one every year. Uh, yeah. You know, some people say you got if you don't have a quarterback, you need to add one every year or this or that. Edge rusher is kind of that thing, you know, like because it, it comes in waves. You can shoot the, the Colts have tried to play a bunch of them this year, so you can never really have too many. And, you know, whether or not the first or second round is too early, I really think there's only a select few guys that you go for. I don't think you make it like a high priority, like we got to get one in the first three rounds. Uh, but I, I definitely think there are some guys who should be high up on their board in general. Uh, you look, you know, we talked about the guys on day one, but some who may fit them, what they look for uh, moving forward, basically on, on day two. You're looking at like Cedric Johnson from Old Miss. Adisa Isaac is someone we spoke about yesterday. You wrote about him in an article yesterday on horseshoehuddle.com as well. Uh, Gabriel Murphy from UCLA. Marshawn Nealon, that's another guy we talked about. Uh, so there, some of those guys, different flavors, but in general have similarities to some of the guys we've seen the Colts add. Whether you're that kind of tweener type that moves inside or outside, or you're that, that fastball type. Uh, I definitely think that's a handful of guys that Colts might look to add that actually makes sense, not just for the sake of adding them, uh, but that actually makes sense on day two. Yeah, and not to devil's advocate for myself here and go against what I was saying earlier. I think the one thing that does work against the Colts when it comes to adding edge rusher in this class is there's just there's just not many Ballard edge rushers in this draft. And, and again, maybe he's changed. Maybe he's turning around, you know, the way that he drafts edge, but he typically takes guys with long arms, guys who are pretty well built, like a little bit bigger uh, on the outside and guys who are very explosive. And there's really not a number of guys who fit all of those metrics in this class. Cause like even chop right. Robinson, who is a fantastic athlete, just a phenomenal athlete has short arms. You know, Gabriel mm. Murphy, Gabriel Murphy that you put in here, his arms are very, very short. His arms right. are like shorter than mine, basically. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're looking at a designated rusher or just, a, again, a niche role in some of these guys. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. I mean, he, again, he, he took Josh Downs last year, and I never would have expected Josh Downs with his size at wide receiver. So we could see what happens there. But again, I don't want to rule out edge rusher because he always does throw capital at edge. And he understands, at least in recent years, that you got to spend top 100 picks on premium players. Uh, and that's what he's been doing. It's been a lot of premium positions and premium players at those positions that he's been spending those picks. Uh, so I can't rule out edge rusher with their first round pick or with their second round pick uh, whatsoever. But coming up, guys, we're going to shift gears from the early round talk to the late round talk where, look, day three, this draft is loaded with athletic talent on the offensive line. And it's the perfect avenue for the Colts to address their depth uh, there on day three. 
But first, the sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning of a $5 bet. That's 200 bucks that you can use to bet on the tourney, MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more. Look, Indiana fans, I know you guys got it tough. You don't have a baseball team. You don't have a hockey team. But for me, and you know, I get to throw all my money on the Capitals and on the Nationals and have a bunch of fun losing all that cash. So you guys can join me. Join me and throw some money on my favorite teams with the Washington Capitals and Washington Nationals and lose money with me on FanDuel. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a big win or a big loss in my case here. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Indy Fuel fans, Indy Indians fans, let this man have it. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, sorry. You guys don't have major league baseball That's or true. I don't or think you can bet on those league. guys and on Fandle. That's true. Yeah, we'll we'll have to petition for that there. But going into offensive line, uh, I do think this is a fantastic class for the Colts to address offensive line because look, just like we were talking about at Edge, 2025 could look very, very different on the Colts offensive line. Last year they had a lot of continuity, not in terms of everyone staying healthy, but in terms of you know, the fact that they had all their guys coming back from the year before they had Ryan Kelly out there for most of the season, Quentin Nelson and Will Fries did not miss like any time. Brian Smith had a tough year, but you know, he still was effective when he played and Bernhard Ryman was very good as well. When he played, you know, they got kind of lucky with those guys all taking a step forward. And for the most part, outside of Brian Smith, you know, they were fairly healthy, especially at the guard position. But now when you look at 2025, you got Will Fries coming up on a new deal. He's going to need his new deal uh, in 2025. Ryan Kelly is going to be a 33 year old free agent. So you need to look at the future of center. So you, again, this is another position where you need to draft a little bit for the future. Uh, but luckily, I mean, I know Jake that you listed all these guys by looking at uh, RAS, the Raz or whatever there on, mm -hmm. on math bomb. Luckily there is a lot of guys here there on are. day three. You listed like 20 names here of just the, the top uh -huh. Raz guys. And I, and I will be completely honest, just looking at this list. I think when I was doing my build a Ballard for interior offensive line, I think all of these guys were on there and then some like it yeah. was it's a very, very loaded class on day three for athletic offensive linemen. So I really would like the Colts to come out of this draft with, you know, another center, another guard, maybe another tackle. I mean, there's one tackle on here we'll talk about, which makes a ton of sense for the Colts. But um, I, I do think they need to come out of this day three with a couple new offensive linemen just to add competition, add depth and just also prepare for the future where, you know, maybe Fries and or Kelly are not here next year. Absolutely. And I I mean, the kind of the metric I went by was guys with at least a RAS of nine or above or high eights that I figured I've, I've heard the Colts might have uh, kicked the tires on. And dude, there's a lot. I mean, centers, there's six here that I listed, five guards, a few tackles. So like it's booming. And, you know, I'm not even deep into the offensive line study this year like you are. So you probably know of way more guys. Um, but Matt Miller, the guy who's, who's uh mock draft we talked about yesterday, he actually, he tweeted something that I thought was a really good point. And it, I think it's especially good for offensive linemen. Um, the amount of experience of these like four and five year starters, because athleticism yeah. is awesome, but for offensive linemen experience is great as well. That's why you always see like Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, North Dakota state, even like these guys are there starting from you know their sophomore seasons basically and they have a ton of experience and, and they're always at least pretty good when they get to the league so the combination of athleticism and experience that can't be slept on like I, I think day three of the draft will be super offensive line heavy because going back to the senior bowl talking to Jim Nagy he said day three is going to be really tough because uh, you know there's been a lot of NIL a lot of transfer uh, in the COVID year, still we're, we're still seeing the remnants of that. It's led to a lot of guys being in school forever. Uh, and that may not be something that teams covet at like receiver. But when it comes to offensive linemen, like I think those guys are going to strike gold on day three. Yeah, no, for sure. And and when I was doing my build of Ballard for interior offensive line the other day, I noticed that the Colts had not drafted an interior offensive lineman in Ballard's time that had fewer than two, 2,400 uh, snaps in his college career, 2,400 total snaps in their college career. The, the fewest snaps of an interior offensive lineman that he had drafted was Quentin Nelson, who declared after his true junior season. So uh, that was kind of an early declaration type guy. 
uh, and he still had over 2,400 snaps. I mean, you're looking at guys like Will Fries, who were, I think he was a four-year starter at Penn State. Uh, Javon Patterson, uh, who I know didn't really make it with the Colts, but he was like a three-year starter at Ole Miss. Um, just guys like that. You know, these guys started a lot of games at the college level. Danny Pinter started a ton of games at both tackle and guard and in and, and, and college and also at tight end. He started a couple games there. Uh, so when you're looking at that Balor type on the interior offensive line in particular, you know, there's a lot of guys that fit that. I mean, Mason McCormick from, from uh, South Dakota State. I know we've mentioned him a ton on here, uh, but he's a guy who's, you know, started at, at – South Dakota State for the last four seasons. And he's won two national championships. So he's played like 17 games those two seasons <laughs> there. I mean, this guy started probably like 60 games in his college career. Uh, some other guys on here, Christian Mahogany from Boston College. I know he's, he's had some injuries, but he started a ton of games. Jake Kubas and, and Jalen Sundell from North Dakota State are both in this draft class. Two guys who are like 24 years old who started a ton of games. These guys are ready for NFL play. You know, they might be older prospects, but – you know, when you're looking at, at day three guys who are probably going to be more depth players anyway, it doesn't matter if they're 21, 22. It matters that they know how to play the position. And these guys have started, you know, a ton of games in their college career. They know what they're doing. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot of guys to like here. I mean, two centers you didn't even mention that I that I think can be in that maybe round three to round four range is Tanner Bordellini from from Wisconsin. And then uh, Bo Limmer, who we've talked about a lot from Arkansas. Those guys make a ton of sense. But some other guys here, Dylan McMahon from, from NC State, Nick Gargiulo, I think it's Gargiulo from, from South Carolina, Jalen Sundell, Kingsley Egukon from Florida. At guard, there's Mason McCormick. Jared Kingston is, is a super high builder Ballard fit. CJ Hansen from Holy Cross, Christian Mahogany, Jay Kubas. Like, there's a lot of guys who make a lot of sense at guard and center to where, again, I'd be shocked if the Colts came out of this draft without – a couple of these guys like they they need to add just more talent and and competition uh for training camp like it can't just be sills again being your only guy uh backing up at guard but i, I do think the colts are going to add some athletic players on day three to to fill out that guard and center role and you know again be guys who potentially could start uh after this next season yeah absolutely because like you mentioned the the injuries were another thing that really affected the depth because you had your your swing guys were starting a lot of games or they were playing serious snaps. And then, so you just didn't really, you had depth luckily to cover that, but then your depth needed depth at that point. And right. so I think you just, you have to have just an, an infusion of talent added to the room and just made the best man win. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now when we go to tackle, it's not a great offensive tackle class for the Colts. <laughs> like, I think Smaller there's some group. guys, yeah, there's some guys early in the draft that would make sense, but I don't think they're in a position where they can take tackle early. Uh, but I do think it's funny that the one guy who is like the ultimate Bill DeBallard fit on day three is a 25 year old uh, real estate agent from Wyoming. <laughs> that's that's the funniest one right there at the combine, put up these insane numbers. And look, like when I did Bill DeBallard for offensive tackle, we're comparing these guys to you know, Joe Witt and comparing them to um, Blake Freeland, Baron Hart Ryman. Like these are all time great combine performers or, or pre pre draft testees. So it's a very high standard when I'm looking at Chris Ballard's past draft history with tackle. Uh, but Frank Crum from Wyoming was the only guy there. Crum, Crum real estate agent uh, there out there in Wyoming. I think he's like 25, 26 years old, uh, but he was the perfect fit there. So you know, I, I think when we all saw him at the combine, we we're all saying, okay, there's Chris Ballard's tackle on day three. But uh, I do think it's funny that that's the only guy who was the, who was the perfect fit. Some real estate agent out in Wyoming. <laughs> no, this is, this is definitely going to be a stump the truck draft, especially on day three for the Colts. Like it, it gets a little frustrating in, in the immediate aftermath, having to try and Google and find out who the heck that is. The Colts just drafted, but like, that's part of the fun of it is like, when you find the Jake Witt in the draft, who you have no idea of, and then you find out, oh, this guy's actually pretty interesting. And then sure enough, you've got your Frank Crum, who you know is is a blowing things out of the water before the draft. So now yeah. th this will this will be a good one. I'm, I'm excited to see what super obscure athlete they pick up. Yeah, you know, it's funny, and, and we don't have much time here, so I'll say it real quick, is Dane Brugler always writes these like very in-depth story pieces on these small school guys. And they're really great stories that he writes before the draft. But I think last year was Jake Witt. the year, like a couple years ago, he wrote one on Mike Strawn. So I was like, okay, whoever Brugler is writing about, that's who yeah. the Colts going to draft because we know that's a freaky athlete. But Hey, look, as long as it's not the EJ speed debacle again, where ESPN and NFL uh, 
you know, NFL network have no clue what position he is. They're putting wide receiver. They're putting quarterback. They're putting uh defensive end because even he didn't mm-hmm. know what position he was. I think that happened with Rodney Thomas too. They put him at corner on draft day and stuff. So, well, he played linebacker at Yale. He was corner linebacker and safety. So it's like, what yeah. is this dude getting to do? Yeah, so we'll see which guy uh, Ballard takes this year that makes us question what position he is at the at the next level. Uh, before we get out of here, guys, though, I know we mentioned a lot of draft prospects today, so the, I just want to remind you guys that the Indie Draft Guide's pre-orders are still open. For $8.99 with code DRAFTMISS in all caps, you get access to an essential piece of reading for Colts fans both before and after the draft, featuring 225 in-depth scouting reports features and much more click the link in our show notes pre-order today and if you guys don't already make sure you're following at locked on colds at jake arthur nfl and at zach kicks Two all on twitter also subscribe to us on youtube where i'll be listening to your podcast we'd love your guys ratings reviews and we'll catch you guys back here tomorrow afternoon